Racecraft by Barbara J. Fields and Karen Fields. This is the conclusion, Racecraft and Inequality. In the preceding essay, Emile Durkham and W.E.B. Dubois grapple with the racism that usurped democratic politics in France and the United States at the turn of the 20th century. Our viewing them together stands as a reminder that what Americans designate by the shorthand race does not depend on physical difference, can do without visible markers, and owes nothing at all to nature. As the social alchemy of racecraft transforms racism into race, disguising collective social practice as inborn individual traits, so it entrenches racism in a category to itself, setting it apart from inequality in other guises. Racism and those other forms of inequality are rarely tackled together because they rarely come into view together. Indeed, the most consequential of the illusions racecraft underwrites is concealing the affiliation between racism and inequality in general. Separate though they may appear to be, they work together and share a central nervous system. Does the election of Barack Obama add anything to the old story? When we proposed the present collection to a publisher during the spring of 2008, everyone agreed that we ought to mention the coming presidential election. No matter what the outcome, the nomination of a candidate of African descent by a major party seemed a significant moment. It was not self-evident, however, exactly how and why the moment was significant. If anything, it has become less evident since. The significance of that moment is certainly not that racism has ended. A piece of gallows humor indulged in by a powerful Afro-American member of Congress, even as we pondered our conclusions, delivered a telling comment on the notion that the election signaled a post-racial era in American history. As was mentioned in Chapter 1, in late May 2009, an Afro-American police officer pursuing a car thief in the East Harlem neighborhood of New York City was shot dead by a white New York City police officer who, must, who mistook him for an armed criminal. At a public event two days later, a reporter asked Representative Charles B. Rangel what President Barack Obama should do during a brief visit to the city that he and his wife planned for later that day. Make certain he doesn't run around in East Harlem without identification, was Rangel's off-the-cuff response. Predictably, the remark drew clucks of disapproval from the mayor and parts of the press, and Representative Rangel soon apologized. But what, but what made the remark sting was its tasteless exposure of an undeniable truth. Although the president, surrounded by his Secret Service detail, is safe from any such mischance, other black men, even black police officers, are not. It is true that racism is no longer, as in the past, the unclear weapon of American politics, guaranteed to obliterate an opponent. From the Jim Crow era to Richard Nixon's Southern strategy, to the Willie Horton ads during Bush Sr.'s campaign against Michael Dukakis in 1988, an appeal to racism could not fail, even if, since the end of World War II, the fallout has often contaminated politicians who wielded it. Orville Faubus and George Wallace spent the last years of their lives trying to dissociate themselves from the grand standing segregationism of their political prime. And Lee Atwater, mastermind of the Willie Horton ads, was widely reviled up to his death and sins. Nowadays, public invocation of racism no longer guarantees success. To the contrary, a racist insult directed lightheartedly at an American of South Asian origin helped to sink a candidate for re-election to the Senate in Virginia in 2006. And in April 2010, the governor of Virginia had to amend a proclamation of Confederate History Month that omitted any mention of slavery. Awareness that old school racism is losing its potency stokes the rage of the diehards. Thus have arisen such laughable antics as priming six and seven-year-old children to chant, assassinate Obama, assassinate Obama, while riding a school bus in Rexburg, Idaho, the day after the election and agitating to prevent the president from speaking to public school children about the need to study. 
A talk show host in Kansas City implied that the president could not be trusted around children. I wouldn't let my next door neighbor talk to my kid alone. I'm sure as hell not letting Barack Obama talk to him alone, he declared. Thus, too, have arisen less laughable antics. The circulation of shooting range targets bearing the president's photograph, websites advocating assassination, and the carrying of loaded firearms to presidential events. Though politically ineffectual, such activities are not harmless, given the ease with which homicidal zealots like Timothy McVie, the Oklahoma City bomber, may acquire firearms, explosives, and lethal chemicals. Even if troglodyte racism no longer plies the surface of American life, it still hides out in sub subterranean fastnesses to emerge now and again in episodes ranging from the trivial, segregated senior proms in Southern public schools to the serious, the exclusion of Afro-Americans from jury service in several Southern states to the deadly, the murder of an Afro-American security guard by a white supremacist at the Holocaust Memorial, Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Nor are persons of African descent alone in discovering that troglodyte racism remains just below the surface. Obama or no. In the spring of 2009, an all-white jury an all-white jury in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, found a Mexican immigrant as much to blame for his own death as the drunken white cowards who kicked and punched him to death in a six-against-one street assault. Many local white residents agreed with that verdict. While troglodyte racism breaks the surface only now and again, workaday racism remains a workaday reality. Obama or no, the poverty rate among black children is approaching 50%. Unemployment among Afro-Americans stands at twice the national average, and the rate for Afro-Americans with college degrees is twice, and the rate for Afro-American Afro-Americans with college degrees is twice that of white people with college degrees. At the end of 2009, an estimated 563,500 black men and 28,000 black mo women were in state or federal prisons, a rate of 3,119 per 100,000 U.S. residents for men and 142 for 100,000 for black women, while Afro-Americans counted for 14% of drug users in the, United, in the United States in 2006. They accounted for 35% of those arrested for drug offenses. 53% of those convicted, and 45% of those in prison for drug offenses as of 2004. <clears throat> the penal disparity begins early. The case of a six-year-old Afro-American girl arrested by police officers and taken away in handcuffs for throwing a tantrum in her kindergarten class is extreme only because of the child's age. Nationally, zero-tolerance discipline falls disproportionately on poor Afro-American children, who are suspended from school for minor infractions at a rate three times that of white children for similar conduct. Residential segregation, the outcome of deliberate government policy as well as individual actions, provides the material underpinning for many forms of everyday inequality based on racism. The provision of unequal resources to public education in black urban and suburban neighborhoods depends on it. The purging of black voters from registration lists using formulas based on zip code depends on it. The provision of inferior public goods and services in redlined neighborhoods, transportation, post offices, banks, street cleaning and lighting, trash disposal, policing, zoning depends on it. So does the disproportionate placing of environmental hazards, sewage treatment plants, toxic waste dumps, manure lagoons and highways. In or near such neighborhoods, the stranding of New Orleans residents during Hurricane Katrina demonstrated the lethal cum cumulative outcome of such inter in inertial racism. Segregated in neighborhoods peculiarly vulnerable to a storm surge, they were further isolated by the reliance on public transportation in an automobile-centered society. Few onlookers praised them, however, for having green credentials. Instead, their carlessness registered as fecklessness. If they did not load family and belongings into an SUV and drove to a motel 
when advised to evacuate, something must be wrong with them. Racism and class inequality in the United States have always been part of the same phenomenon. Afro-Americans began their history in slavery, a class status so abnormal by the time of the American Revolution that it required an extraordinary ideological rationale, which then and ever since has gone by the name race, to fit plausibly into supposedly Republican institutions. Emancipation discharged most of the former slaves into another status, that of a working class, that Americans, including the emancipated themselves, did not yet accept as a basis for citizenship. Like Jefferson, the former slaves regarded land ownership as essential. In the transition from slavery to freedom, anomalous class position defined Afro-Americans as a race. Once that definition became ingrained in social practice, improved class position might at any moment fall subject to a racist veto. Even today, professional achievement can entrap a black person in the coils of a tacked sumptuary code. Thus, for example, an Afro-American former police chief dared not carry his weapon when off duty in the predominantly white neighborhood where he lived. Having been stopped and questioned several times while out for a morning jog, he feared that carrying a weapon might turn an annoying encounter into a lethal one. Nor is a black man's home necessarily his castle, as Shem Walker learned when he ordered a drug dealer, as he supposed, off his elderly mother's front stoop in Brooklyn, New York. The drug dealer turned out to be an undercover police officer conducting a buy and bust operation. And when Walker tried to shove him off the stoop, the officer or his partner or his partner shot him dead. The whole incident, choosing private property for a potentially violent undercover operation in the first place, and then deciding to shoot rather than leave when requested by the householder, would have been inconceivable at the home of a white person. The initial designation of Afro-Americans as a race on the basis of their class position has colored all subsequent discussion of inequality, even among white persons. In racial disguise, inequality wears a surface camouf camouflage that makes inequality in its most general form, the form that marks and distorts every aspect of our social and political life, hard to see, harder to discuss, and nearly impossible to tackle. The pattern began when slavery helped to mute class inequality, be inequality by sheltering the white majority of the South from the cold winds of national and international markets. Furthermore, the presence of slavery defined freedom, restricting, restricting the imaginative scope of democracy even for white people in the northern states. Movements of working people ran into ideological headwinds when they claimed a birthright as American, beyond the simple absence of slavery and formal, in, formal equality before the law, for example, a 10-hour and later an 8-hour day. During the Jim Crow era, many white voters in the South lost their right to vote under cover of the same laws that disenfranchised black, black voters. While good government reform in the North often meant efforts to restrict the popular franchise. At the same time, however, the consolidation of Jim Crow set in motion a new dynamic of racecraft and inequality. With segregation and disenfranchisement, legal and explicit, complete with white-only primaries in a one-party system, a political bloc became entrenched in Congress that could define rights and entitlements for white Americans while making specific provision to exclude Afro-Americans. Allotments to the families of soldiers during World War I intended to preserve the absent soldier's position as breadwinner of his family produced the unintended consequence of affording black soldiers' families the means of livelihood without signing on for domestic and agricultural labor for white employers. Thereafter, the Southern segregationist bloc dictated the exclusion of domestic and agricultural laborers from Social Security and other New Deal welfare legislation. Similarly, they designed the GI Bill to limit the bulk of its benefits to white veterans. The civil rights era inaugurated yet another dynamic of racecraft and inequality by removing the legal basis for the exclusion of black Americans from both the body politic and the body social. When the long post-war economic expansion ended during the upheavals of the 1970s, 
white working people no longer enjoyed special white-only entitlements, such as GI loans and education, nor could space be cleared for them by explicit di discrimination against Afro-Americans. Indeed, were every, back, were every black job seeker to be denied employment, there would still not be enough jobs for all white claimants at a time when five people are vying for every job opening. By the same token, as a wag once pointed out, if all the claims by white persons to have lost jobs because of preferences for black persons were valid, every black person would have to be holding down five jobs. Today we live with a new version of the racecraft inequality dynamic, with the economic deck now stacked against most working Americans and the white-only post-war bounty at an end, Racecraft offers white Americans a plausible way to hold someone responsible, but not an effective way to seek redress. Thus, for example, a white electrician in Martinsville, Ohio, held food stamp users, visualized no doubt as Afro-American, in such contempt that he was ashamed to tell his parents that he himself needed government help to feed his family. His own family's needs did not soften that contempt when he noticed crowds of midnight food stamp shoppers once a month when benefits get renewed. Though a food stamp user himself, out at midnight on legitimate business, he assumed that the people in the crowds were not on legitimate business. Generally, if you're up at that hour and not working, what are you into? He remarked. Racism tagged the midnight shoppers as into something unsavory because they appeared to be out of work. Racecraft concealed the truth that the electrician and the midnight shoppers suffer under the same regime of inequality. Racism as readily prompts a suspicion that black Americans who hold jobs are into something unsavory if they hold jobs from which discrimination previously excluded them. In 1990, Northern-based racecraft artists helped the late Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina keep his Senate seat in a hard-fought campaign against an Afro-American opponent, Harvey Grant, or sorry, Harvey Gant. They devised an ad in which white hands crumple a job rejection notice while the voiceover says, you needed that job, but they had to give it to a minority. So far from displaying a proper sense of shame to campaign Apparatchiks disputed authorship of the infamous advertisement. In truth, both black and white rural North Carolinians need, needed that job, unbeknownst to those taken in by the now famous White Hands ad, all would shortly face the departure en masse of manufacturing jobs, costing Robinson County, one of the hardest hit, an estimated $713 million in jobs income and business taxes. The race crafters contrived via television a collective hypnosis that stigmatized hardworking black people while concealing the regime of inequality. Smoke from the fire of white workers rage obscured the air conditioned boardrooms where executives chose overseas destinations for North Carolina's ma manufacturing jobs, heedless of whether those left without work were white or black. Racecraft operates on both sides of the screen, moreover. It provides a template for understanding inequality, whose taken-for-granted rules are so pervasive that knockoff versions of them move down through the echelons. At a high school in a neighborhood where young black men had attacked Mexican immigrants, black students disparaged black classmates from backgrounds poorer than their own. In the same neighborhood, Mexican-Americans who had been born in the United States disparaged classmates born in Mexico. A black sophomore at a high school in the neighborhood apparently felt no stirring of either irony or historical memory when he pulled out of mothballs an old standard of segregationists. I've got nothing against Mexicans. They work for my moms. One even made me breakfast this morning. That's awful. Many a mistress from Jim Crow days distinguishing her Negroes from the general run might have said the same thing. The black and Mexican students could no more recognize their own circumstances in those of their classmates than the electrician could recognize his circumstances in those of fellow food stamp recipients. In a manner of speaking, Racecraft steps down the current of macroeconomic inequality to suit the small appliances of everyday life and the limited purview of their hard-pressed users. 
What happens when nothing is stepping down the current and inequality appears full power as what it is? Perhaps what happened during the fall of 2008 when a public outcry led the House of Representatives to vote against using the taxpayers' money to rescue failed bankers from the consequences of their own greed, incompetence, and folly. For a long moment, ordinary American taxpayers, regardless of ancestry, vented their outrage. Tea Party sentiments began to percolate, if not yet to crystallize or coalesce. Fuming while bankers received what they considered their due, and while CEOs landed in Washington, one man, one jet, to stake their claim for public assistance. Working Americans of all backgrounds seemed to demand simultaneously. Wait just a cotton pick in minute. There stood the culprits, the outrageous embodiment of privilege in the midst of everyone else's loss. Their every gesture amplified Obama's call for change. At that moment, large numbers of people shouted a spontaneous hell no into the prevailing wind of politics as usual. But politics as usual won. The opposition party rescued a discredited president's plan to save the top 1% of the population, once again at the expense of everybody else. Still, a fissure had opened through which one might glimpse, or at least imagine, a politics in which the mass at the bottom might stake a claim against the arrogant entitlement of the few at the top. The election of Obama held the potential under those circumstances to lift the taboo on public discussion of inequality. Racecraft being what it is, however, the chatter at the time fixed instead on the president's ancestry as the true significance of the moment. But what was truly significant was the elections taking place against a background of economic collapse that called in question 30 years worth of apologetics in favor of, any, of inequality. Inequality of income, of wealth, of social prospects supplied the raw material, the engine, the fuel, and the spark for disaster. Between 2002 and 2007, the income of the top 1% of American families grew to an annual rate of 10.1%, while that of the bottom 99% stagnated at a rate of 1.3% a year. In 2007, the top 1% of families received 23.5% of total income. No wonder real estate prices rose above the decaying economy like a helium-filled balloon, and no wonder financial instruments designated for speculation based on the balloon appeared and multiplied like maggots. The devil makes work for idle wealth as well as idle hands. Meanwhile, modest salary and wage earners survived by taking on ever-increasing debt, but, me but metastasizing indebtedness cannot overcome the consequences of inequality. CEOs earning 500 times the salary of their firm's average employee could not spend 500 times as much on items of ordinary consumption, no matter how self-indulgent or, or acquisitive they might be. Investment bankers surfeited and designer clothing, or with designer clothing, diamond encrusted watches, fancy cars, yachts, aircraft, and extra houses still could not replace the aggregate demand for goods and services of persons whose income scarcely rose during the expanse of years from 2003 to 2007. While those at the top were busy devising exotic ways to spend, invest, and shield from taxation previously unheard of amounts of wealth, the bulk of American wage earners kept up their contribution to aggregate demand by borrowing chiefly on houses and credit cards to meet everyday needs. The ensuing collapse cost more than 2 million Americans their homes, depleted pensions, and wiped out savings for retirement and education. Even discounting for the notorious understatement of official unemployment statistics, which ignore persons who have given up looking for work, the figure of 14.6 million unemployed as of summer 2010 fails to capture the sensation of the ground sinking under the feet of working Americans. According to a survey by the Pew Research Center, 55% of the adult workforce suffered either the loss of a job, a cut in pay, or a reduction in paid working hours. That does not take into account prevailing conditions on what someone has dubbed Backstreet, in contrast to Wall Street and Main Street, where poverty predates the current collapse by at least 10 years, where urban hunting of squirrels, raccoons, and rabbits ekes out family meals and where a family of five may crowd into a single bedroom.
Governments at all levels, local, state, and federal, have been forced to retrench just when the need for services is greatest. They are turning off streetlights, ending trash pickups, laying off police officers, closing firehouses, hospitals, schools, daycare centers, and senior centers, reducing school years, trimming hours at kindergartens, libraries and museums, eliminating health programs for the poor and unemployed, cutting back mail delivery and reducing public transportation while raising its price, or as in Clayton County, Georgia, eliminating it altogether. The lost income of furloughed or fire government employees threatens further losses or closure for small businesses that rely on those employees' patronage, business already driven to the edge by the credit squeeze and the loss of customers through unemployment in the private sector. The disaster also landed the United States in the absurd position of fighting two simultaneous, interminable, and vaguely defined foreign wars, while relying on foreign governments and central banks to hold the IOUs of the world's number one debtor nation. <coughs> the honest accounting that the collapse called for soon veneered off track, however, or soon, not veneered, soon veered off track, however. In mass media commentary, the up to the eyeballs indebtedness of the average household became a moral failing of the borrowers, incidentally opening a portal for racecraft, rather than the consequence of a skewed economy setup or economic setup. By a subtle shifting of the kaleidoscope, the excess ceased to be that of bankers celebrating a coup in the mortgage market with $3,000 bottles of wine at lunch and became instead that of Jane Doe, who fulfilled a modest dream of owning her own home for a brief while. First time homeownership, once deemed praiseworthy, became instead the object of scorn. Miss Doe was consuming above her place. The shadow of racecraft reached beyond Americans of African descent to darken the horizon of a wide swath of working Americans, regardless of ancestry. Meanwhile, as the jobs of ordinary workers went up in smoke, those responsible for the disaster imagined themselves its victims, and the media ampl amplified their voices. Thus, a vice president of the American International Group, a company bailed out by the taxpayers to the tune of $182 billion, whined at being denied his contract contractual bonus. After all, neither he nor his division caused the losses. Neither did millions of the unemployed whose farms fell victim to the banking crash through no fault of the employees themselves or their erstwhile employers, and the taxpayers neither paid them bonuses nor saved their jobs. Press accounts underlined the difficulty of living within a salary of a mere half million dollars a year for bankers accustomed to multi-million dollar bonuses. A new genre replaced lifestyles of the rich and famous. Hardships of the super-rich demoted to the ranks of the merely rich. For the founder of McAfee Associates, hardship meant the dwindling of his fortune from $100 million to $4 million, and the sale of three of his homes, one of them a complex that included a general store, a cafe, a movie theater, several aircraft hangars, two guest houses, a swimming pool, and a fleet of antique cars for the use of house guests. A perverse language of moralism eclipsed reality. According to much of the commentariat, the subprime fiasco occurred because too many people coveted houses they could not afford. The truth, of course, is that no subprime borrower, or prime borrower either for that matter, secured a loan by holding a gun to the head of a mortgage company officer. Unemployed persons and minimum wage employees might equally have coveted yachts helicopters and corporate jets that they could not afford. But bankers and mortgage company officials did not fall over their feet, making loans for such purposes or packaging and securitizing them for sale to, to investors. Instead, they climbed onto the subprime bandwagon because sensational fees beckoned as the real estate bubble inflated, seemingly without limit. They discovered a sudden enthusiasm for subprime loans in a, in a poor neighborhoods that they had previously redlined, that is, declared off-limits for lending. Redlining continued, nonetheless in a different form, 
High-income black families were nearly twice as likely as low-income white families to end up with subprime loans, even if they qualified for prime loans and offered a down payment. Spreading the contagion around the world, investment houses bought up mortgage originators or created new ones because the packaging and securitization of subprime loans generated higher fees than conventional loans made on prudent grounds. In such reckoning as has followed the disaster, the prime movers and the economic collapse have all escaped imprisonment for their actions. The only person to go to prison for mortgage fraud was a man of modest resources who took out a so-called liar loan with the knowledge and encouragement of his broker. Inequality never stands merely as fact as the way things are or the way things are done. It requires moral reinforcement in collective beliefs. What beliefs and of what sort depends on place and history. In a society in which each person was presumed to serve in that station unto which it has pleased God to call me, as the Anglican Catechism used to put it, inequality was justified because God ordained it. That standard teaching had gone into eclipse in what became the United States of America by the time Jefferson and the other founders revolted against George III. Eventually, other doctrines came to uphold inequality. Up to the day before yesterday, the Orthodox Catechism in America held that inequality is a good thing because it promotes economic growth that ultimately benefits everyone, even if the benefits accrue only modestly, if at all, to those on the bottom. According to the dogma, efforts to lessen inequality through progressive taxation or redistributive public spending infringe the liberty of the rich. Furthermore, the rich deserve their reward, ostensibly buttressing that view were studies suggesting that inequality in wealth and income results from genetically programmed differences in IQ. Intelligence determines merit and merit apportions rewards. The racist implications of the most celebrated declaration of that thesis deflected attention from its implications for working class white people. That, like Afro-Americans, white people consigned to the lower reaches of society were there because of low intelligence. Until the curtain tore in 2008, criticism of inequality thus remained beyond the pale of acceptable public discourse. From the earliest days of the Republic, racecraft has lurked in the background when it was not surging to the front of any contest over the purposes toward which Americans might turn their political institutions. It ties our tongues and plants minds in our language. To many white Americans today, the word welfare irresistibly conjures up lazy Afro-Americans and cheating immigrants until they need it themselves, like the electrician in Ohio. And even then, its associations cause feelings of shame that would be inconceivable to their counterparts in France, Germany, Scandinavia, or the UK. Franklin D. Roosevelt enshrined freedom from want among the four freedoms that he hoped the United States would champion throughout the world. But to appease his party's segregationist power base in the South, he agreed to exclude agricultural and domestic laborers from the provisions of the Social Security Act. What is more, thanks to slavery, welfare had become a suspect word long before it had anything to do with social benefits for individual Americans. Slaveholders carefully excised the word from the Confederate Constitution. Theirs, unlike the Federal Constitution, did not undertake to promote the general wel welfare, nor was the Confederate Congress empowered, like the Federal Congress, to lay and collect taxes, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general wel welfare. After all, a government empowered to promote the general welfare might one day construe that welfare to require forcing the states to abolish slavery. And what now? Even as commentators at the time of Obama's election claimed to discern the coming of a post-racial era, their very harping on Obama as a black president reprised an age-old feature of racecraft. The turning of one person of African descent into a cynic doc for all. The classic, or the classic historical instance is Booker T. Washington, anointed by powerful white persons to speak on behalf of all Afro-Americans. Because disenfranchisement had robbed them of the democratic prerogative of choosing spokesmen for themselves. 
designated one designating one Afro-American as a proxy for the rest masked the abrogation of democracy. The token replaced the proxy during the civil rights movement when Afro-Americans began to reclaim their rights as citizens. A handful of students admitted to a white school to stave off calls for thorough desegregation. One person's accomplishment advanced as an argument against demands by the rest. If Ralph Bunch can be ambassador to the United Nations, what more do Negroes want? When does it went a segregation refrain or segregationist refrain during the 1950s and 60s. That bewhiskered ideological ploy resurfaced in the aftermath of Obama's election when the newly installed attorney general charged that Americans are too cowardly to tackle racism. A political columnist retorted, Barack Obama's election was supposed to get us past that. In similar vein, a legal scholar concluded that the election of Barack Obama ended the need for the Voting Rights Act. Americans of a certain age may think to themselves, this is where we came in. Stokely Carmichael's rejoinder to those who held up Ralph Bunch to forestall further agitation, I can't have Ralph Bunch for lunch, applies today as it did then. Afro-Americans cannot have Barack Obama for lunch, any more than white Americans had George Bush for, for lunch. Nor can Afro-Americans or any other Americans have Barack B Obama for the county council, the school board, the zoning authority, or the road commission. But local areas are where people live, unless they belong to the well-heeled and borderless cosmopolitan elite. Local circumstances form the material of their everyday lives their children must walk through mud to reach a school bus in the black section of a rural county does not depend on the president's ancestry, but on whether the children's parents can hold the county road commission accountable. The racecraft inspired political cynic doc short circuits the issue of accountability. As president of the United States, Obama does not in fact belong to Afro-Americans more than to any other group of Americans. Arguably, he belongs to them less. Having kept his distance while campaigning for the presidency, he, was con he has continued to do so in office. President Obama, a columnist observed, would rather walk through fire than mention racism. They're prepared to brave public censure for a multi-billion dollar payout to the bankers who wrecked the national economy. He shied from intervention to hasten modest and long delayed compensation payments for Afro-American farmers approaching the end of their lives, to whom the USDA denied loans freely available to white farmers. And he kowtowed with unbecoming haste before a false charge of racism leveled at an Afro-American official by a white blog bully, well known for mendacity and dirty tricks. Weariness of appearing to favor Afro-Americans sometimes drives Obama to cultivate the appearance, and at times the substance of aloofness from their aspirations. The racecraft cynic doc operates asymmetrically since there is no parallel category of white president for Obama's predecessors in office. It went without saying in the past that presidents were free to act in the interests of white Americans and against the interests of black Americans without paying a political price. The sword of racecraft thus dangles over Obama as it would not over a white president who favored white Americans or who simply treated them fairly. Right-wing opponents of health care reform could insinuate without provoking a hoarse laugh that the purpose of the proposal was to benefit Afro-Americans. The maneuver worked, not because the claim rested on any evidence whatsoever, but because the cynic doc made the argument without any need for evidence. Adept at racecraft ritual, the opponents knew that identifying health care reform with black people would frighten away many white people who might otherwise have supported it. A right-wing blogger even dared to refer to Obama as a welfare thug. He probably did not expect anyone to take the epithet at face value, any more than did the talk show host who opposed Obama's meeting with schoolchildren by implying that he might be a pedophile. Both were manipulating a familiar device of racecraft to telegraph that Obama, that Obama is the black president, not the president of the United States. Nevertheless, it is of moment for everyone, not just for Americans of African descent.
that Obama registers as a black president even while steadfastly refusing to act as one. Precisely because racism shares a nervous system with inequality in general, the same inclination to shun identification with black Americans makes it impossible for him to identify with the modest wage and salary earners, the unemployed and the working and disabled poor of all ancestries. In short, the bottom 99% of American society. It is one of the perversities of American public language that it is hard even to evoke these people, a majority of Americans after all, without appearing to single out Afro-Americans without, in other words, becoming entangled in racecraft. Even as racecraft casts Afro-Americans as the heavies, it plants self-doubt in the minds of the growing ranks of white Americans, who feel the ground sinking beneath their feet. Once racecraft has ingrained the idea of food stamps as the province of undeserving black people, even changing the name to Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and replacing paper coupons with a plastic debit card cannot ease the shame of white recipients. Once racecraft equates the mortgage collapse with black people living beyond their means, white families unable to meet the mortgage or with mortgages underwater find themselves similarly tarred. Racecraft makes democratic possibility hard to imagine for all Americans, not just those who are directly in the crosshairs of racism. Racecraft is a ready-made propaganda weapon for use against the aspirations of the great majority of working Americans. Sooner or later, tackily or openly, any move to tackle inequality brings racecraft into play. The crude and stunted language available to discuss inequality and to stake claims for our due as Americans illustrates the powerful ideological undertow that racecraft sets up. For example, discrimination and reverse dis discrimination are the closest we have to terms in which to claim a right to a sustaining job. They are not very close. Such terms presuppose that jobs are a scarce good to be fought over by those in need of them rather than something Americans can claim as a matter of right. They presuppose too that the moving of jobs overseas or their destruction and a banking collapse is an act of God rather than a matter of public policy in which all of us have a stake and in which all of us should therefore have a say. The United States has no such thing as a jobs policy. No public priority attaches to, per, or attaches to providing jobs for persons eager to work. The result is, in effect, a jobs policy limited to those at the top. The taxpayers rescue the jobs, salaries, bonuses, and perks of the bankers who ran their firms, and the American economy along with them, into the ground. Meanwhile, people put out of work by the bankers' shenanigans are on their own, punished a second time by employers who refuse to consider applications from those who have lost their jobs, regardless of the reason. According to one advertisement, governments may even encourage businesses to lay the fault for layoffs at the door of laid off workers. In Florida, the state house and Senate differed over whether to reduce the duration of benefits for the unemployed or make it easier for businesses to represent the loss of a job as the worker's fault rendering him or her ineligible for benefits. The country seems to be returning to what Franklin D. Roosevelt dismissed long ago as the so-called normalcy of the 1920s. A million and a half Americans had become 99ers by the summer of 2010, out of work for more than 99 weeks and therefore ineligible for further unemployment benefits. And in the eyes of some employers, ineligible for further employment. Opponents of extended unemployment benefits eerily reproduced the language employed against welfare benefits back when it was plausible, though even then inaccurate, to portray the recipients as exclusively black. Government benefits discourage people from getting married and looking for work, according to one version popular in think tanks and on Capitol Hill. Meanwhile, American businesses have turned the elimination of jobs into a source of profit even with sales down. After all, who has the money to buy what they produce? Just as companies are showing a profit without selling, so banks are turning profits by not lending, except to the United States Treasury, which provides them the funds in the first place at virtually zero interest. The lions are being fed without having to hunt, is the way one, one 99er put it. Her language at least was not stunted, but that of the Treasury, treasury Secretary heralding a recovery 
well nigh invisible to the unemployed, certainly was. To the desperation of people without jobs and the worry of those afraid they might soon be, the best answer he could manage was, private job growth has returned at an earlier stage of this recovery than in the last two recoveries. What have we the right to claim as Americans? What are we free to imagine? A decent job, a solid education, health care, dignity, and old age? Like all ideologies, the prevailing ideology of inequality presents both, both a prescription and a proscription, an action and an in inhibition, the thinkable and the unthinkable. A case in point, the city and state of New York and the federal government together pay a registered family daycare provider to look after a woman's children while she works at a low-paying, dead-end job as a waitress at an all-night diner. Her husband has lost his job. The daycare provider costs more than the waitress receives or is ever likely to receive in wages. The mother sometimes has to rouse her children in the middle of the night when she collects them from the daycare provider at the end of a late 10-hour shift. It would be hard for her to visit her children's school, oversee their homework, or read to them. She may even have trouble managing appointments for the children's in her own dental and medical care. The thinkable within the terms of reference of the prevailing ideology of inequality is that a low paying dead end menial job is better than offering the mother a cash welfare payment. No matter how unwholesome the outcome for the children's or the mother's well being, the inhumanity of that judgment can be readily made to vanish in the smoke of racecraft. Once racecraft takes over the imagination, it shrinks well-founded criticism of inequality to fit crabbed moral limits, leaving the social grievances of white Americans without a language in which to frame them. A thoughtful commentator illustrates how unobtrusively the shrinkage may occur. He draws attention to admissions policies at eight highly selective colleges and universities that place white applicants in certain categories at a disadvantage. While participation in extracurricular activities generally works in applicants' favor, he points out, that is not true of participation in such activities as high school ROTC, 4-H clubs, or future farmers of America, activities associated with white people in conservative or red state America. He then resorts to the characteristic language of racecraft, identifying his own list of underrepresented groups, working class and mainly Christian white people from conservative states and regions, and even borrows the language of diversity. There's more to diversity than skin color. By framing the issue as diversity, the commentator has conceded the game. However, admissions officials may tweak their policies. Admission to a handful of colleges and universities will reach only a handful of families, leaving the basic structure of educational inequality intact. Alongside that vital concession rides an even more damaging one that graduates of such institutions constitute a meritocracy, indeed the American meritocracy, from which he laments the white working class is alienated. By saying so, he contradicts the implication of his own argument. If admission to the ranks is skewed and manipulated, then its members are not a meritoc meritocracy in the first place. They are self-perpetuating oligarchy, even if they imagine themselves the best and the brightest. A similar shrinkage of moral imagination under the hypnotic influence of racecraft limits the means of redressing something most Americans would probably consider unjust if applied to themselves. The refusal of employers to consider job applications from the unemployed, regardless of why they lost their job. The practice is legally actionable, it seems, only if it produces a disparate impact on older workers, workers of color, women, or other protected groups. According to the executive director of the National Employ Employment Law Project, what about unemployment persons who fall into none of those groups? What young adult men, for example? The practice is equally unfair when applied to them, but lacks a legal rubric to make it actionable. In the shadow of racecraft, discrim discrimination shoves unfairness out of the vocabulary available for public debate. debate. Racecraft is an illusion that requires constant reimagining. Therefore, even as it shrinks our mental world to its own pulse, pusillanimous measure, it takes up mental energy that we need for better things. 
The comeback of bioracism at this juncture is an act of destructive reimagination on which well-meaning persons are now wasting precious mental resources. It is not a random occurrence either, but a return of ideas developed a century and more ago to discredit a wave of new immigrants, most of them white, in an atmosphere of social distress amid excess not unlike today's. The resurgence of bioracism recalls to the tangle that ensnared those charged with enforcing the ceremonial rules of the Jim Crow South. A woman who scolded Obama for checking African American on his census form, rather than white or some other race, brings to mind the hapless streetcar conductors in turn of the century Charleston, South Carolina. Young Afro-American girls toyed with such conductors by boarding the streetcar in pairs of differing physical type, one black, one indistinguishable from white. The pair would sit together in the empty middle rows of the streetcar, laughing and chatting while white passengers stared and pressure built on the conductor to send them to separate sections. Finally, he would order them curtly to sit the way you are supposed to, meaning that the apparent white girl should move to the white section in front of her companion to the black section and back. At that point, both would move to the back of the black section, adhering to the letter of the law while making a fool of the conductor. The woman upset over Obama's failure to fill out his census form accurately harks back to those conductors, chiding him for sitting with the black passengers. People marching under the banner of biracialism and multiracialism demanding recognition of biracial, multiracial bone marrow and umbilical cord blood an official sanction for biracial and multiracial as categories of human beings may not be aware of the malignant history to which they are signing on. Other destructive imaginers know exactly what they are doing. A blogger with an on again, off again connection to the Tea Party deliberately sought to yoke racism to anger at bank bailouts, intrusive government out of control spending and tax increases by, portray by portraying the NAACP as their source and black people as the beneficiaries. He drew criticism only because his resort to old style racism in a mock letter to Abraham Lincoln, a former slave personified by the president of the NAACP called slavery a great gig, proved both too brazen and too incoherent for many in the movement. The instinct was sound, however, skillfully invoked racecraft can discredit any public policy initiative, good or bad, whether or not designed with Afro-Americans in mind. The destructive imagination that inflates the racecraft balloon sucks away oxygen from the constructive imagining that we urgently need and does so to the disadvantage of all working Americans, not just black or white ones. For example, if the imagination expended in devices to restrict high quality education to a privi privileged few, coaches, consultants, ghostwriters for college application essays, even God save the mark test prep courses for a kindergarten entrance exam were devoted instead to repairing our dilapidated system of public education. 15 year olds in the United States might not rank 15th out of 29 OECD countries in reading literacy. 21st out of 30 in scientific literacy, and 25th out of 30 in mathematics literacy. Private schools and public schools in segregated suburbs may seem to promise better education for those in a position to attain them, but better does not always mean good enough, as anyone who teaches the products of such schooling, as the authors do, knows full well. For example, International students for whom English is a second language often have a better grasp of English grammar, syntax, and spelling than American native speakers trained at elite secondary schools. Racecraft operates like a railroad switch, diverting a train from one track to another. It is unlike a rail railroad switch, however, in that the switchman seldom controls where the train ends up. It may end up on a sliding, on a siding in the middle of nowhere, its passengers stranded. By crowding inequality off the public agenda, racecraft has stranded this country again and again over its history. It may do so again, permitting an economic sickness that arose from inequality to be treated homeopathically by further doses of inequality, which may eventually provoke rage that will sweep away respect for democratic politics and for the rule of law. For stalling that calamity is our duty, the first and fundamental step in that direction is to observe racecraft in action, 
study its motives, listen to its language, and root it out. Only after doing so will we be prepared for the still harder work of tackling inequality. Are we up to it? Occupy Wall Street erupted on the scene after we had sent the manuscript of Racecraft, including the foregoing, to our publisher. Spreading from an... <laughs> Spreading from an encampment in Lower Manhattan in New York City, it set off echoes across the country. Like the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street caught the imagination of a broad public convinced that the economic system is rigged against them. Unlike the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street broke the taboo against making an explicit, explicit issue of inequality. It is too soon to know whether the taboo has been broken for now, let alone broken for good, or whether raising the cry of class warfare in, in defense of the well-heeled few will prove effective in reinstating it. It seems unlikely that persons whose salaries, benefits, and retirement are under siege, whose mortgages are underwater, and who live in fear of being laid off, let alone the working poor in the long-term unemployment or unemployed, will easily accept a portrait of high-flying financiers and overpaid CEOs as job creators or as creators of wealth for anyone other than themselves. But unlike arguments for the benefits of inequality, racecraft does not depend on plausibility for its effectiveness. A presidential candidate's equation of redistribution with redistribution to black people and the effort to discredit a generation of laws against racist discrimination suggests that defenders of inequality may yet find the old-time religion, racecraft, to be a very present help amid awkward questions. <laughs>